welcome you all and thank you all for coming here to the main library tonight at the Louisville Free Public Library uh, for this edition of our My Library U Fast Class series. I'd like to introduce our guests who you probably know. State Representative Attica Scott serves Kentucky House District 41. She is an alum of Emerge Kentucky and has been recognized for her work by Leadership Louisville, the Miss Foundation for Women, and the Muhammad Ali Center. Scott has served on the Louisville Metro Council from 2011 to 2015 and has served on the board of directors of many nonprofit groups in Louisville and beyond. She has taught at JCTC and at Bellarmine and in the Fujian province of China. And she is the first black woman to serve in the Kentucky legislature since 1999. Is that right? 1999? Yeah. Representative Attica Scott. <laughs> And Representative Nima Kolkarni serves District 40. She moved from India to Louisville as a child. She attended the University of Louisville for both a BA and an MBA and the University of the District of Columbia for her JD. She is the owner of Indus Law Firm, specializing in immigration, employment, and business law. She is on the board of several nonprofit organizations dedicated to economic development and the empowerment of women and immigrants. And she is the first person of Indian American heritage to serve in the Kentucky legislature at all, right? Uh, so please help uh, me welcome both of our wonderful guests here. Well, thank you all so much for being here this evening. You're absolutely beautiful. I know we both appreciate y'all for coming out as your two women of color in the legislature. Truly, um, thank you for being here. Uh, this is probably one of those um, few opportunities where we get to have a conversation as real people rather than as politicians on the House floor or in committee um, trying to debate very important issues. So welcome to District 41. I am honored that the main library is in District 41. And I just want to do a check-in to see how many folks here are in District 41. Yay, a few people, <laughs> fantastic. I was able to get two folks to sign my paperwork, so I'm going to be able to file to run for re-election now. And I wanted to um, start out with the question for uh, Representative Kulkarni, because I don't know if people can imagine how excited I am to have her <laughs> serving in Frankfurt um, for, for just a year, a very um, brief year. Well, for almost two years, I was the only woman of color in oh, Frankfurt, yeah. period. And um, so when Representative Kulkarni said that she was going to run, I made it my business to lace up my shoes and go knock on doors <laughs> because I was not going to be the only one anymore. And so thank you for stepping up, for running, and um, for the, the truth that you bring to well, the legislature. Well, I wouldn't be able to be there without you. I mean, she really did. I would, looking at the state legislature is scary if you're a person of color, much less a woman of color, um, and not necessarily you know, above a certain age. I can't imagine what it was like for her for even two years by herself. I mean, this is something that is historic. She immediately suggested that we start a Women of Color Caucus, which we did, and we're hoping to you know, double and triple our numbers by just adding one at a time. And it's slow going, but I'm on board with that. So I just wanted to thank you for all the work that you do. Awesome. For you as the only um, immigrant in the legislature, period, what is it like for you to get up in the morning every single day and drive to Frankfurt to do the business of the people of District 40? I do a lot of thinking and resetting of my mindset, going, moving outside of sort of this bubble that I live in in Louisville, um, and really trying to make sure I remember that I'm going into a place where there's a lot of different experiences, a lot of different viewpoints, probably none of which align with mine um, every day or all the time. Um, and so getting up in the morning and going to Frankfurt has, has a bit of that. And it's, it's helpful to me, I think, in, in life generally to be able to reset and objectively look at a situation and say, this is not how I'm approaching it. I need to be able to take into account and value and respect whoever is around me and just start out from the basic uh, understanding that they're here for the same reason that I am, which is to serve the people of Kentucky. And I find that drive very calming. I mean, I'll sometimes have to take phone calls and things like that, but if I don't, I really, sometimes I'll turn the news off, I'll just turn the radio off. I find, you know, it just helps to reset, and I think that's very, very important. So for me, that's what I do in the morning. If I have to go to Frankfurt, I kind of use that time 
um, that drive time to reset and align, you know, what I want to accomplish that day with what obstacles I, I anticipate. So that's essentially what I've been doing all week, um, and that's what I do every time I have to go to Frankfurt. Well, and so what um, Representative Kulkarni is alluding to for this week is that it's committee week in Frankfurt. So once a month, we have committee week in Frankfurt, and I was remiss in not acknowledging that our colleague, State Representative Reginald Meeks is here. Representative right. Meeks, thank you so much for being here. Our, our districts parallel uh, one another, so we're often working on some of the same issues and, and working together on those issues. He's also chair of our legislative Black Caucus, of That's which right. Representative Kulkarni is uh, a member. So um, thank you for, for sharing what it's like for you to, to get up and, and go to <laughs> Frankfurt every single day. You talked a little bit about getting ready for um, being in the presence of people who probably think differently than you on a lot of issues. Can you talk a little bit more about what that's like to be in Frankfurt and to look around and to know that, you know, in a, uh, a room that's um, got about this many people, 100 members of the House, you are the only one who's an immigrant and you are bringing a different perspective. Can you dig a little bit deeper into what that's like for you? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we both experience the same thing. I'm I, I'm interested to hear your experience for the first two years in the legislature, having no other woman of color, um, and how you kind of strengthened, you know, or I don't know, steeled yourself um, to face that um, whenever you were in Frankfurt. Uh, because I really, and I'm, when I say this, it's true. I would not be there except for you, women like you, um, and knowing that it's okay because somebody has my back. Um, and we, we talked about this, encouraging younger folks to do that as well. Um, I think a lot of people in Frankfurt are, um, find me curious, um, maybe are a little confused. They don't really know where I'm from or what my religion is or what I eat or don't eat. Um, I have yet to find a legislator that didn't know me previously that can pronounce my name properly. Um, and that's okay. You know, you got to let the little things go. Um, because I think they do, they have tried to reach out to me, you know, in a friendly way where we're not sort of fighting it out over a bill or a piece of legislation that, you know, neither of us agree on. Um, because I think there's a curiosity factor there, and I'm going to exploit that as much as I can. Um, you know, but that, that is true, and I, I think it might be a little bit different coming into that situation as an immigrant where there's not a whole lot of stigma or stereotype because people just aren't aware and don't really know where to put you, like where to fit you in. Um, and I, I think that's, that's been an interesting experience. Um, I, I know that people have, people say all kinds of things, not realizing that it's a stereotype or it might be offensive or it might, how you're going to take something. And, you know, I, I, there's a learning curve. I'm going to give them a year and then they're going to have to smarten up. Um, so that's, that's where I'm coming from. <laughs> yes, thank you for that. And you talked about that sometimes people just aren't aware that they don't know. But I will add there sometimes when people do know and they do yeah. know better. And so there have been times on the House floor where, um, you know, there have been resolutions that have been anti-immigrant. And so, um, you know, I sit behind Representative Kulkarni in the House. And so I'm, I'm looking at her and asking myself, what, is, what am I called to do in this moment? Am I called to sit here because it's not about me directly? Or am I called to speak up um, even if you know, my voice shakes, even if I feel uncomfortable, even if I look around and 92 of the people in the room are white, right? And, and no one else is saying anything. But what you said about making sure that people have your back when we talk, we're mm -hmm. talking about a notary, well, that's the same in the legislature, is I want Representative Kulkarni to know that I have her back and that she's not alone. And so when those things happen, I'm going to speak up. Um, even if I don't know exactly what to, to say, I'm going to say something. Um, because her experience is not mine, so I'm not going to try to speak as if it's my experience. But I am going to say that this resolution is wrong. Um, and um, that as a legislature, we should be better than this. It can, we have those moments where those we kinds do. of things happen. And I just want to quickly make a comment that this is probably going to be the longest conversation Representative Scott and I have had. Uh, we just don't have time to get into these types of issues and go get coffee or anything. So this is actually good for us as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I did, I did want to sort of follow up on that. You know, you, you and Representative Meeks, you all invited me to join the Legislative Black Caucus. I'm not black, 
I don't know what that experience is like, and I would never pretend to know what that experience is like. I'm, I'm curious, you know, because a lot of times you find people trying to divide up minorities. So you're an immigrant, you're this, you're that, you're from this country, you're from this area, you're from this neighborhood. Um, I, you, there was, I didn't experience any of that, and I, I hadn't even thought about that, and then you, you, you all invited me very graciously um, you know, to really learn from you and to learn from your guidance and your experience and wisdom. Um, and, and it has enriched me. I think a lot of new legislators don't have that. You know, I've been lucky to kind of have that. And I wanted to get your thoughts on, on that, the idea of, um, you know, different types of minorities and, and how our society kind of pits us against each other um, and why you just did not even hesitate you know, to make sure that I was invited to be a member of the Black Caucus? Well, I know for me and for Representative Meeks, it was important that um, the only other woman of color <laughs> is not by herself, right, in Frankfurt. And you're not by yourself. I, I don't want anyone to walk away thinking we're by ourselves. That's not what I mean. But what I do mean is that um, our experiences are unique as women of color. As a black woman, my experiences are unique as an Indian um, woman, your experiences are unique. And um, as a collective, the Legislative Black Caucus, our, one of our goals is to make sure that we are advocating for people of color, period, across the Commonwealth of Kentucky. So it would only make sense to welcome you, to invite you to be part of the caucus, because we are about building together. Um, it, it would not have made sense for us to have our Legislative Black Caucus, we meet with you know, the, the eight of us, yeah. and then there's you. And it's the Senate and the House. So it's, yeah. I think that's something that a lot of people in our legislature haven't really experienced either. I mean, you can't really lump us into one or the other group. And I think that's something that is good. It's good to challenge people. It's good to make people think, OK, what's this about? Where is this person coming from? I don't really, I can't pin my um, you know, stereotypes on you. Um, can you talk a little bit about when you first got there? Um, I know you're, you're very, I mean, Representative Scott is very, very open about her life um, and, and where she stands on issues, you know, but I, I was just curious because what was it like for you as the only woman of color for mm -hmm. two years, especially in the beginning? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I do tend to be very open. Um, you know, most people know by now that I got braces yesterday because I told the world. Um, and then she went right on television, right to live television. And like an hour or so later, Representative Kukarni and I were on WHAS 11 talking about tonight. Um, and so, you know, I've had to be thoughtful about that openness because my daughter is, um, she's now a student at UofL. And I mean, she's for the most part cool with it because I, you know, I, I don't put all the business out there. But sometimes she's like, okay, mom. I don't think people want to know that much. Um, and Representative Meeks is very good about reining me back in. He's like, you don't have to tell them everything. So, um, but I will say that those first two years, I actually was trying to protect the people in District 41. I didn't want my constituents to know all the stuff, the crap, the mess um, that was going on. I really tried to keep things high level, focus on you know what are the legislative issues that we're talking about. Um, what am I learning as a new legislator? And I'm still learning to this day, and I will hopefully, as long as I serve, continue to learn. Um, I, I would hope that there's no one person serving in the legislature who feels like they know it all, um, because it might be time for you to go. So someone else can come in and serve and learn something uh, new and different. But um, it was really about protecting the district. I didn't want to go out into a whole lot of what was happening. But then I was um, reminded that, um, it's important to share your stories and experiences because if people don't know, they can't have your back. They can't support you. They can't speak up um, and be there for and with you. So I slowly began to share a little bit about what was happening, um, shared about how I was the only black woman in the legislature, 100 seats, and you know I was seated behind the guy who had campaigned using images of the Obamas as apes. And and I was like, I went to my leadership and I said, so I'm the only one, the only black woman, and somehow the decision was made to sit me behind this guy who won his election using images of people who look like me as animals. And so I told them that would have to change. So you know that happened and then the next year, um, 
or actually that same year, we were debating an issue around neighborhood schools and ending busing. And I remember being the only black person who had stayed for the education committee meeting and having someone say, well, if we, if we don't end busing, uh, we're gonna have these urban kids who are gonna be walking around shooting up drugs and shooting people. I was like, so I'm looking around, no white people are saying anything, and the guy was white. So I, I challenged him on it. I was like, how dare you? You know, how dare you? Because um, we know what you mean by urban. Um, I don't, I'm not one for sugarcoating and mentioning words and trying to use, you know, words like urban when, we, when you mean black, so to say black. And then that evening I got an email from someone who said, why are you always so angry when you speak? <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> but, you know, and I had to really think about my response because my first response was a what aboutism, and I was like, don't do that, don't be that person. Because I wanted to respond and say, well, what about the guy who made the comments? But I let it go, and I, I don't even know that I responded because I thought it was so ridiculous. Because um, I tend to keep my tone just like I am now because I knew going in, I have lots. People lose their minds over natural hair, and I'm black and I'm a woman. I already knew that angry black woman trope was gonna be used on me. So I, when I speak, I try to speak you know, just like this all the time. So nobody would have a reason to say I'm angry, which is really sad because white men can slam stuff down, throw books down, point at folks, raise their voices, and it's all good. Let me do it and it's over, right? She's gotta go. So, you know, I have to be mindful of those things and slowly began to share them with the district right. because I thought it's important for you to, for folks in the district to know what's, what I'm experiencing so that they can, you know, be there if I need them to be there. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And you've got a really strong, I think, base of support. I think we can see all of that. District 41 is awesome. It's, <laughs> is, I'm going to have to ask, is anybody here from District 40? Yay! You got a few. Yay! Actually. Oh, that's a, oh my gosh, I should have brought it. Wait, there's a notary. All right, we're going to do this. Come find me. That's very exciting. Yeah. I'm very, you know, interested to know, like I'm going to be one of those curious people in Frankfurt, um, what what has it been like for you to, to be able to, you know, look at your family and say, your daughter, your sister is a state rep? What has that been like for you? It's been fantastic. So both my parents are here. That's my mom sitting next to Representative Meeks. That's my dad next to the food. Um, <laughs> they've always told me I could do anything I wanted to do, right? So from the get-go, what I saw my parents do was move from another country to Louisville so that my brother could attend the DePaul school. They, you know, you may have heard this story, maybe you haven't, but they, my dad was an executive, my mom, they both have degrees, spoke English, could not find a job here, um, you know, at all. And so they started a small corner grocery store, Swan and Oak, which is in Representative Meeks's district, and it's uh, still an operating store of some kind to this day. Um, you know, knowing nothing. My dad's slicing deli meat, never sliced. I has no idea. I'm like pricing cans with one of those label guns. I was young enough where I was like, this is fun. There's a bunch of candy and ice cream here and food I've never seen, you know, <laughs> I have no idea. Um, so this was great. Um, but that's the underlying thing that I saw was in that district, how everybody was just open arms, right? And this is primarily a white district. It was a lot of German immigrants, I think, at that time. Um, a lot of older people. And so we would, we would get sent out with our little um, grocery baskets to deliver groceries to the uh, elderly neighbors that were kind of right around, right around the store. And they felt fine sending us there. It was just me and my brother, you know, we were little. And that's, that's, that's what I remember about growing up um, and, and, and learning about how you can go from something to nothing and then build something up all over again. I mean, that's the American dream. I mean, not to sound, not to be cliche or anything, but that's exactly what it is. Um, and so that's what I know about being an immigrant in Louisville. That's what I know. And, and coming back, I moved back in 2010. You know, there's a change, obviously, we've seen in the past few years. Um, there's a lot of rhetoric going on, you know. And, but I know, I know this city, I know the people that live in this city, and I know that we're better. I know that you know, because I grew up here and I know what I experienced, I know what our entire family experienced. That's, that's what I know about the city and I think that's important to remember 
And I think it's important to share that story because people don't necessarily see that now, especially people that are moving here in recent years. Thank you. Your parents are awesome too. Very I think so. Love you. <laughs> um, oh, your mom's store is in District 41 too. <laughs> oh, yes. So my, I'll go ahead and plug my mom real quick. So my mom started a nonprofit called the Beaded Treasures Project, which is, where is it, on 4th and Chestnut? 4th and Chestnut. The Volunteers of America has uh, sort of acquired her program and is using it throughout their, their entire community. So that's, that's a huge accomplishment. It helps refugee disadvantaged women um, learn a skill, market the skill, make an income out of the skill. So make them self-sufficient is the whole goal of it. Uh, my dad was the first director of the Office for Globalization in Louisville, so I've just, I've got a lot to live up to. Um, so I'm, I'm still catching up to them. Awesome. What are some of the issues that you're passionate about um, that you want to work on in Frankfurt that may be unique to your district um, and why the values and, and vision behind you running? So I think a lot of the issues in my district are probably similar to a lot of other districts in Kentucky. People are concerned about jobs, good paying jobs. They're concerned about educating our kids. They're concerned about how they're going to retire. They're concerned about the environment. Um, but this is something, you know, what has driven me to run is because I think I can bring new ideas, new perspectives to these solutions. There's a lot of dots out there that can be connected and we can solve these issues instead of just doing the same thing over and over and over again. So, you know, one of the bills I've pre-filed is reinstating the prevailing wage for labor. Like, I have a lot of union members, a lot of labor unions in my district. Um, and so they have been sort of under attack for the, certainly the past few years, but we've been seeing this going on nationwide for a long time. Um, and how to bolster that, right? And there's a lot of people that want to learn a skill. Let's connect the dots. Let's not just let everybody work in their own silos. Um, so that's one example. I think certainly there's a lot of women, women of color, right? So in my, in my district, when I was out knocking doors, who are interested in starting their own business. There's a lot of people that want to start their own business, but they don't know how. You know, you have to pay, you have to register with the Secretary of State. Um, there's a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of things you have to do to maintain that annually. Um, so, so things, real basic things like that that I think could have a real direct impact on my constituents, those are the issues that I'm focused on. Um, it, it, there's not a whole lot of immigrants in my district, they, and it doesn't matter, they didn't care where I came from. Um, I want to help them, right? That's the whole reason I'm there. I think I can bring some new ideas to old problems um, and work with representatives like Attica Scott and Reggie Meeks um, and whoever is willing to work with me to solve them, not just in my district, but throughout Kentucky. Thank you. And I think it's so important um, what you just said about your district. Um, your district is mostly white, right? But well, it's, you know, it's and the shy. I mean, there's a lot of like the white, white. It's I don't know what the breakdown is. It might be half and half. It or, might be half and half. Yeah. So you've got black, white, and you, yeah. right? <laughs> and, and and but your district, but your district voted for you. That wasn't the issue. That was right? not the issue. It, it was about who yeah. you were going to be, right? And we agonized. Record. I remember we agonized about they're not going to be able to pronounce my name. They're not going to remember it on the ballot how it's spelled. Should we just go with Nima, which is only four letters? You know, it's easy to remember. Nobody cared. I mean, the, the fact is, and I'm sure you've experienced this, and you do this you know, throughout your district, you know, not just canvassing, just I know you, I see you out there all the time, um, making sure that your constituents know that you're there for them, right? What are, I'm not there. I'm not going to Frankfurt for my own agenda or to gain something. I'm, I just want to bring your voice to the legislature. So what are your issues? What are your concerns? And, and I think that's what you know, public office is about. It's a public office. We're public servants. Um, it's not about us. It's about making sure that we are representing our constituents. So I think they didn't care in the end. They cared that I showed up. I knocked on their door. They might have been a little confused. A lot of people were like, you know, are you the candidate? Are you knocking for the candidate? How old are you? You know? <laughs> um, but once I started, you know, talking about stuff, I think they, they realized that I was sincere that I really meant what I said and that I was just trying to help. And that's, in the end, I think that's what did it. Yep. And she'd be the long-term incumbent. So if you're thinking about running for office and you have a vision and, and you've got support and you've been talking to people about it, do it, right? You know, please don't let anything hold you back because 
these seats don't belong to us. We are temporary right. occupants um, until the folks in our districts decide they want someone else or we realize it's time for us to move on. So um, thank you so much for, for being open to my questions. Because I know you thank didn't you. really know what I was going to send wasn't your way. I was sure. <laughs> Friendly fire. Yeah, that's right. You all raise your hands. You all pick them and I'll run towards them. Please wait for that. No, it's not about it. It's for everybody else. What led you to decide to run for office? First, you were in the council. We just moved here from Colorado in 2013, and you were starting to get started. And so we were kind of watching you because you were younger and you were black. So what was it that pushed you? First time I ran for office was for school board. Um, both my kids were in Jefferson County Public Schools. And um, there are seven members of the board, and I think maybe two had kids who were actually in the school system. So I was like, oh my, I'm a mom. Well, this hasn't changed that much, y'all. Um, that was nine years ago. I was like, I'm a mom, and there, there aren't parents like me who are on this school board. So um, I got together with some of my friends um, to say, OK, we all were around each other's kitchen tables for about a year to say, OK, what offices do we want to run for? We didn't feel like we were being represented in both local and state office. Um, and after a while, they decided that I should be the person to run for office because I had the fewer skeletons in my closet. Um, you know, I, I, you know, my choice of friends. Um, and, and so I ran for school board. And I didn't win, which was OK. You don't have to win every election. I think it's great when people are like, I've never lost an election. That's fantastic. I have, and I'm a state rep now. So uh, I'm trying to be nice. Uh, but um, then I served on Louisville Metro Council, which represented me, served on when it was the Board of Aldermen, and um, didn't win my re-election to council. And then for a year after that, State Representative Mary Lou Marzin, if you know her, she's the best, for a year she was on my case. She said, we need you in Frankfurt, and we have someone we would like you to run against. She said, if you need to move, move. So you can be in this district. I was like, oh, I, I don't do that. I talk about people who do that, because I think it's a terrible thing to do. Um, but lo and behold, because of redistricting, I ended up being in that person's district. And right, right? <laughs> Things happen for a reason, I believe. And so I ended up running uh, in 2016. And um, we were running against a 34-year incumbent. Who were you running against? Former Representative Reiner, Tom Reiner. Have been in for 34 years, so um, and um, was also a Democrat. So we primaried him. Of course, you know we don't like those things apparently as partisan people. But you know I'm also not a all-in for Democrats kind of person because we have a lot of issues and we have need to do a lot of work to be a better party. And so I'm one of those people who pushed to say, let's do better. And one of those ways we needed to do better was to have a representative who represented the entire district, not just people who align with their vision and values. Thank you for the question. I know what it feels like to have a name that's hard to pronounce. My name's Tig. Uh, Tig. It's, it's, you, you can you try to it? spell it. Uh, it's spelled T-A-D-G-H. Oh. So that's old Irish. But uh, I was going to say that. So, I want to say two things before I, or uh, one thing before I ask my question. So uh, I follow a lot of uh, left-leaning politics, especially with the Democratic Party. Uh, Ilian Omar, Bernie Sanders, uh, Osagio Cortez. Uh, and now, after hearing you two talk, both of you, I feel like embody uh, the ideal politician. Somebody that well, supports you. the everyman, no matter the race, no matter the class, and no matter the gender. Um, and I want to I wanna say that's uh, commendable, especially with some of the things that our president has said. Uh, at rallies, um, people saying, send her back to Senator Omar, who is a US congresswoman, mm -hmm. um, and probably works harder than anybody in the Congress. Uh, so I want to say that even with the climate, uh, thank you for coming out here. Thank you for running, and thank you for representing the American people, regardless of race, gender, anything I mentioned before. So seriously, thank you guys. It's inspiring. Uh, and my set, my my real question is, um, 
to piggyback on that, uh, you can kind of offer an example to the power dynamic with a lot of uh, state governments, um, especially in the South. Uh, for example, um, and this may be kind of out in outer space, but uh, with a lot of curse words, there are a lot of curse words that demean women. Um, the, I mean, I'm not gonna go through the childish, like the B word, they say, people know them. Uh, whether it's their sexual habits or just who they are, whether they're bossy, quotation marks. Um, but there are very few for men, and the ones that are for men are feminizing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanna say, I wanna ask you, how has that power dynamic of white, rich men in these government seats, um, going into like the gladiatorial rink with these men, how does that power dynamic uh, control how you act? You know, you go into it, like I said, assuming that everyone's there to serve the people of Kentucky. I'll just start with that. Um, knowing that, you know, in their heads they're thinking whatever they're thinking, with their friends they're saying whatever they're saying. If they have, you know, the audacity to say something that they know is offensive in front of me, about me or about somebody that, they know, that I know, you have to, there's no power dynamic. There's, you just call out what you see. And I, I think I have to credit my parents again for that upbringing because I was not raised to be scared of anybody. Um, and I think that's what you have to, there's no reason to be scared. They're there just like you. Their you know, constituents voted for them for whatever reason. Um, and, and if they're saying something that's incorrect, and a lot of times it's ignorance. You know, and you just treat it like a teaching moment if you're feeling that generous or just call them out. I mean, I, I have, after this year, um, and to Representative Scott's point, am no longer, or, and I never really did, but I did try to work sort of across the aisle, make sure that everybody um, was on the same page, kind of. But it's, you know, it's just a situation where if you see something like that or hear something like that, that is the moment where you say, this is not acceptable. It's not acceptable to me. It's not acceptable that you say something like that in your position. And you're, you know, why do you, why do you think you're allowed to say something like that out loud? Um, whatever it may be. And again, it might not even be something specific to me. It just might be something that they're used to saying because, you know, it's common in their community, common in their household, whatever it is, um, you just can't stand for it. I mean, you have to really just stand up against it and say something at the time, in the moment. Yeah. And my experience has been more around, less around gender and more around race. And so when things like what happened this session, when you had people trying to compare abortion to the Holocaust and slavery and, and lynchings, um, we had to speak up, and we spoke up as both the Black Caucus and the Women's Caucus to reject that narrative. You can, you can still um, believe in whatever it is that you believe in. Um, you don't have to be insightful by trying to compare anything to the Holocaust or anything to slavery, anything to lynching. We don't have to play comparison politics, right? right. That, that isn't even the point. The point is that you have something that you want to push, a piece of legislation, a resolution, um, and so you can push that without trying to um, hurt other people uh, in the process, in that way anyway. Yeah. With the upcoming change in the gubernatorial administration, um, are you optimistic that um, you'll be able to see more of your legislative goals accomplished in the upcoming term and that there won't be so, so much extreme opposition? Um, or are you concerned that they might become even more entrenched? Um, you know, with the majority party and with the other state elected officers, or do you just not know yet, um, just kind of what your, your feelings are for the upcoming session? Yeah, I don't know. Um, and part of that is, at least for me and, and the legislation that I file, I file legislation that comes to me directly from constituents. I file legislation based on what I'm observing is um, important in Jefferson County or in Kentucky, and also based on um, just paying attention to what's happening in Frankfurt and where we're going and where, where we need to try to stop some things before they happen or where we need to open up doors of opportunity. And so my legislation it focuses on things like um, uh, reproductive health, focuses on issues like 
um, banning discrimination, with, you know, for somebody like me who wears natural hair. Um, so it, it focuses on police accountability, making sure that, I, you know, if there's a, a police shooting, that there's an independent body that investigates that shooting. Well, even with our governor-elect, I don't know that those are the issues that his administration is necessarily going to wrap their arms around. So um, I'm going to have to push, but I'm also making sure that I go back to the district and say, hey, all, this is what I'm working on. We know these issues are real, and I'm going to need your support to push the administration, to push the legislature to at least hear some of these pieces of um, legislation, because they aren't the kinds of issues and topics that are being discussed. It's as if um, we limit ourselves to maybe five topics that we hang on to in Frankfurt, and then everybody else kind of gets left behind. So I'm trying to make sure that I file legislation that brings people along with us. And so banning discrimination is one way that you bring people along so that people don't get fired, which I've had stories share with me uh, of people getting fired because of their hair. So, um, but no one in the governor and governor-elect don't look like me, and so their experiences haven't been that. So it's also going to be a lot of education that I'm going to have to do, and I have been doing in the three years that I've been in Frankfurt, is educating people about why the issues that I'm um, advocating for are important. Um, probably more than, than people feel like they need to educate me on why their issues are important. I'm just supposed to go along, I guess, um, because we all think the same, apparently. But um, <laughs> That's not necessarily the case. So I'm cautiously optimistic um, because I think a lot of things that the prior governor started, didn't quite finish, or whatever his priorities were, are no longer going to be priorities under this administration. And I will bring up you know, the Medicaid expansion. We're not pursuing that waiver anymore. Um, I served on the Public Assistance Reform Task Force. I was the only woman and the only Democrat on that task force, and the idea of it was to find reasons to increase work requirements, to make, make sure people had drug screening, and just really stigmatize and continue to stigmatize, I should say, and just make it harder for people to get the help that they need at a point in their lives when they need it the most. Um, and so we had a lot of meetings, um, and everybody that came and spoke to us was saying the exact opposite. Right. This is not what we need to do as a state. This is bad for Kentucky families. It's bad for everybody. It's bad for the government, bad for the economy, on and on. Um, and we had our final meeting yesterday. And I think that was something that this, the prior governor really pushed for, these work requirements, this drug screening for public and assistance. Um, and, you know, just all the wind out of those sales is essentially what happened. So we're not... There's no appetite for it, is what some of our, um, you know, our GOP colleagues have said, because that governor's gone. You know, so I'm seeing already changes, priorities that are not going to be pursued, and so I'm cautiously optimistic. That being said, we are in Kentucky, and there will always be like those five issues that that are, you know, sort of button pushing um, for certain constituents, and that's I don't think we're gonna necessarily get away from that, um, you know, for a long time, so. So being women of color in the workforce um, and experiencing, like, racism and misogyny, how do you sort of um, learn to become diplomatic about, or, or not about it, but um, when you experience it and not sort of, uh, you know, speak out of uh, an extreme sort of, like, passion you have against that, you know, and just like, how do you how do you build yourself up to that? Because I find myself struggling as to like how to respond dip diplomatically and not lose my job. So, <laughs> yeah. So I view a situation like that as, and this is this is not how it should be, um, but you have to be the adult in the room, right? And that's kind of how I, I have view it. So I, like Representative Scott said, she always speaks in these measured tones. Um, you know, says things very deliberately, gets her point across strongly, but, you know, pragmatically in a very focused way. And, and that's what we all try to do, and we have to because, again, we cannot sink down to whatever level, um, you know, is, is the level that has antagonized you. Um, and I find that if you just 
if it's just a smooth blank facts or whatever whatever you know the conversation is that's a lot more effective or has been and I'm an attorney so maybe that's got something to do with it I mean that's just you just have to do that um, and I'm an immigration attorney so you have to do that like in a hostile kind of environment um, but you have to be calm you have to just be the one that is rising above that situation um, and even if you it doesn't turn out the way you didn't turn you know change anyone's mind or anything like that you know that you reacted in the more sensible the more rational the more competent way um, and that is a win and, and I'll use um, a real example that happened to me this past legislative session so representative Meeks and I serve on the education committee and um, I've been serving on that committee since uh, I won my election and because I am an incumbent I have the right to request whatever committee is my top committee that I want to make sure that I serve on which is education. I'm very passionate about education. And so when we were um, filling out our assignment sheets, and I put education as my first assignment that I wanted to, to serve on, um, I was actually removed from the committee. And so I went to our leadership because I'm trying to follow protocol. I think that's part of what is important to do as well, right? When you have mm -hmm. that, that measured response and you're being the adult in the room, which is not always easy. Um, and so I went to my leadership and said, oh, I filled out the paperwork and I should be on the committee. Can you help me out here? Um, because I'm not in leadership. So it should be leadership talking to leadership. And so um, they made their first effort to get me back on the committee and it didn't go so well. So being measured only goes so far. So I uh, then decided to do a screen uh, shot of where I sent my email with my paperwork 10 days before it was due requested to be on the education committee and I posted it on social media because <laughs> I wasn't going to do this by myself and it wasn't working with leadership so we obviously needed to take it to another level and the staff for uh, the GOP who makes those decisions responded to a, one of my posts on Twitter to say basically he was like look little girl um, you know how things work and you just have to be patient so I didn't respond because <laughs> I needed some, a moment of prayer first. <laughs> so before I could even respond, some teachers started responding. And they were like, but she sent you a picture of the fact that she sent this in 10 days before it was due, uh, re making this request. And as an incumbent, she should be on this committee. So they like read him uh, the way that they could, as only teachers can do, <laughs> um, much better than I could have. And uh, within a, a couple of days, I was placed back on the education committee because I had my receipts and I shared them. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes we have to do that, right? Because yeah. um, as, and Representative Meeks knows this, as um, the what total of nine uh, uh, people of color who are in the whole 138 body legislature, um, we, we, We'll do, we will follow protocol, we will go to leadership first, as we should, but if that doesn't work, then we can't allow ourselves to be diminished. You know, we can't allow ourselves to not have a voice and to be disrespected and to be treated unlike everyone else who got their assignments as they should have. So if you, sometimes you have to figure out, okay, well, what's that next step if following protocol didn't work? But I'm always an advocate. Sometimes I'm an advocate for following protocol. <laughs> I looked at Representative Kukarni in the eyes and I was like, that's not true. <laughs> um, you know, so, sometimes you, Most of the time. Yeah, most of the time. But some of us would not be here had we always followed protocol and, and what that's other right. people decided was how we should operate. Would you talk a little bit about the process and how important it is for the regular people to follow the General Assembly, how easy it is to follow the General Assembly, how important their voice is in letting legislators know how they feel about bills, kind of what that process is. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, this, you know, you just asked me a question that put me in my comfort zone. So, because <laughs> um, I came to, to politics from an organizing and activist background, I was coordinator of Kentucky Jobs with Justice, and so, um, and I remember when I served on Metro Council, I was told by someone in the administration that I'm no longer an activist, I'm now part of government. And I was like, 
that I didn't know they were different. <laughs> but so um, KET has this amazing app that I would encourage everyone, if you're interested in what's happening in Frankfurt, to download the app. And every day, they let you know what's going on. What are the committee meetings that are happening? What time we go on the House floor? What time the Senate goes on the floor? You can go in if you're interested in the issue. That's something I think a lot of people don't know. I mean, if you have an issue that's important to your heart, it's, it's important to make that short trip that's right. or long trip that you need to be there. Our meetings are public. So if you're able to, to get to Frankfurt um, in person, physically, we have a really good website. I mean. Very informative. Really good website. It's LR not the prettiest website, but it's, it's very informative. It's not the prettiest. It could, it could be better um, as far as that goes, but it's actually a really good website. Yeah. LRC, as in Legislative Research Commission, .ky .gov. And you can follow bills. So if you wanted to um, uh, track uh, how a bill is moving through the legislature, so for example, um, one of the bills I pre-filed mm -hmm. is um, teaching African American and Native Indian history in our middle and high schools. And so, uh, yeah, but you know, people are like stressing out. Why would we want to do that? Yeah, oh yeah. How many times have I been asked, have I seen the standards? Yes, I have. Um, and we can always do better. The, the new standards for public education. But we can always do better. So if you wanted to follow that bill, you could go to lrc.ky.gov and you can um, track the bill when it's assigned to a committee, you can track whether or not it receives a hearing, you can track what the vote was for the bill and then whether or not it passed and it goes to the full house for discussion. You can also find your legislators. Oh my gosh, please know who your state rep is and your state senator is. If you don't know, that's okay, but you can find out tonight by going to lrc.ky.gov and typing in your address. Um, that's important because there are probably gonna be some issues between January and April 15th, which is how long we're in session next year because it's a budget year. So we're in for 60 days versus 30. Um, you're probably gonna wanna find out if they're providing uh, sufficient funding to the library systems mm -hmm. versus like they wanted to do in 2018, which is cut uh, funding to our libraries. And you might wanna call your state rep or your state senator to advocate for funding. Um, and I will tell you, when you call, you won't ever reach us, ever in life, when you call us in Frankfurt. You will reach amazing people who work the switchboard who will get us your message. Please do that because even if you agree with us on something, um, it's important for us to be able to have those green slips. So when you call, we get a printout and it's printed out on green slips that, you know, 50 people called me about this issue around uh, net metering and they don't want me to vote for this. So I'm standing up now on the House floor to tell you I'm not voting for this because I have 50 people in District 41 who um, are not having it. So you're gonna have to find something else to do to get your money. So Kentuckians for the Commonwealth, I've been a member of KFTC since two, when I came back home in 2004. Uh, KFTC is fantastic on staying on a lot of um, human rights and social justice issues. The ACLU of Kentucky, Absolutely fantastic if you care about civil liberties and civil rights. Um, Planned Parenthood, if you care about uh, reproductive justice and reproductive health. Um, lots of different uh, organizations that- If there's an follow. issue, there's likely an organization that's devoted to educating um, and awareness, awareness building for that issue. So even if it's not um, an advocacy group per se where they don't lobby, there will be information specific, 501c3s versus c4s. Um, I think I have that right. Yeah. Yeah. So not lobbying, but just providing information. Um, I will say this. It is, it is incumbent upon the citizenry at this point in time. All we have right now is our vote. So if you don't know who your representative is or if you have a representative and you want them to support Representative Scott's bill, you can call them, get a green slip on their desk saying, you better co-sponsor this bill. And it's literally how many people, I mean, she's, she's talking about voting on a bill where 50 people made their opinion known. 50 people in the entire district of 40, 40, 40 yeah, 40 odd thousand people. That's, so think about that. You want, you, if you have an opinion, don't just assume, you know, because you agree with where our stances align on a particular issue. We may vote that way, but we may need way more support to show why we voted that way, that it's not just we're making this up as we go along. 
it's because our constituents have told us this. Um, this is true for, I'm getting a lot of stuff about various gun control laws, mm -hmm. right? So I'm only hearing from the anti-gun control because people will just assume I'm gonna vote a certain way, but I'm not necessarily gonna be able to say I'm representing my district if all I have is evidence of vote you know, against this bill. So it's important to support your legislator and by saying, yes, I agree with how you're planning on voting for this. Just very simple. You can email. If you don't want to call, you can email. You can call the switchboard and just leave a quick message. Um, on the LRC website, each legislator has a page where you can, there's a contact form. You can just fill in your information and what, what you want to say. You can just say hi to us. It's fine. We would appreciate it. Um, but it's, it's that simple. But I think people don't realize how important this is, how important it is right now. Um, it may not have been so important in your lives even just a few years ago. But if there's an issue, find out about it. Find out about how your legislator has voted in the past about any issue that you're, you know, you may think they voted a certain way, but they didn't. And you need to know that. Know the difference between Metro Council and State Rep. Um, that's one thing. Everybody knows who their Metro Council member is. Not a whole lot of people know who their state rep is or what they do. And that's okay, but you can learn and you can find out. We are more than happy to answer any questions you have. Um, that's the main thing. We are here for you and please contact us. I need to know what my district is thinking. I need to know what their issues are so I can make sure that they're advocated for properly in Frankfurt. Um, so whatever the ways of getting involved, the fact of the matter is you have to get involved. I mean, contact. Just, I have a question. I don't know who my representative. I, I don't know what this, where this issue is going. Uh, we're in the process of pre-filing bills, so this is actually a very good time um, to contact legislators and say, hey, I think this is a problem in our neighborhood. Can you do something about it? Um, maybe so, maybe not, but at least we'll be aware of an issue that you have. Over 50% of Kentucky is female, but we only have 13%, and that number goes statistically way down, woman of color. So my question is, you're going to be working with people who might not look like you, might not think like you. So what are some bipartisan issues that you worked on and bipartisan issues that you look forward to working on with this new administration? So I am currently working on a um, black maternal health bill. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I'm very excited about that. And I'm really um, hopeful that that will be a bipartisan measure um, because I believe that when we improve um, infant mortality for black babies and maternal health for black women, that we're going to do that for all women. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that one, having some bipartisan support. I'm very clear that a lot of the other pieces of legislation that I file will not have bipartisan support. Um, for whatever reason, uh, we unfortunately are still in a society across the country that doesn't believe we should hold law enforcement accountable. So there, I don't expect that there will be a whole lot of bipartisan support for um, the police accountability uh, piece of legislation. But when it comes to health and wellness, I mean, that's universal. Um, the bill that I pre-filed around removing the pink tax or removing taxes from menstrual hygiene products, Democratic and Republican people have periods. So that should have bipartisan support. That shouldn't be up for debate. We didn't have a whole lot of bipartisanship in the session, this last session, and it's the only session that I've experienced. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful, um, and, and maybe, again, with the change in this administration, we will see a lot more of this need to work together. Um, so we'll, we'll see. What is the single most important lesson that you've learned from your experiences in government? about government or even about life in general? One of the most important things that I've learned, and this is in recent weeks, is how important it is for me to make sure that I'm able to focus on the priorities and the needs of my district. Um, because there is stuff thrown at you all the time. There's very, you know, sort of minor details get blown up and then they take over everything and you forget you forget about you know, maybe the main important points that you're there to advocate for. 
um, because you're in this larger fight for you know Kentucky and making sure that all Kentuckians are safe um, and things like that. But you have to. I think that's that's the big takeaway for me is to make sure that I have some way and take act, take actual time to make sure that I reconnect and focus on the specific needs of my district. And that's always there, but to make sure that they do not ever get, um, you know, sort of put, put on the back burner for these larger issues. And I'm going to make sure that does not ever happen uh, going into this session, which is also why I'm pre-filing like crazy uh, before that starts. Two young women from Eastern Kentucky who stopped by my office to say, thank you for being the representative we wish we, ha we had. And so for me, coming from Louisville, coming from, uh, you know, my district stretches from Westport Road East all the way to almost Chickasaw Park West. Um, and folks in, in District 41 tend to be pretty um, liberal and progressive, whatever that means to you. And to have those two young women from Eastern Kentucky stop by my office to say that just was a real grounding. It was a reminder. It, it was what I needed to hear to know that I was sent by District 41 to represent Kentucky, right? So I appreciate them for that and that, I appreciate them for that lesson. Is it a benefit to us as citizens to also comment to those who pass legislation or who vote for legislation that is not conducive to good country health? Yes, definitely. So. Um, my first year in office, I had a woman call uh, Frankfurt to leave a message for me. And many people, when they call, they'll say, oh, she doesn't have to call back. I'm just leaving the message. I'm really grateful for that because we have a lot going on. Um, but she did ask for me to give her a call back. And she disagreed with me wholeheartedly on a vote that I had taken. And so we had a conversation. I said, well, let's talk about this. Um, what's your perspective? She shared her perspective. I shared mine. And she even said to me, I hadn't thought about it that way because my life experience was different than hers. I didn't change her mind, she didn't change my mind, but we had a really good conversation and that was important. I don't wanna just call you back when you agree with me. I wanna call you back when we don't agree as well so that we can figure out you know, where each of us is coming from and I can learn something from you and you can learn something from me, hopefully um, that's the case. And we can figure out where we agree. So she and I probably agree on five things, but there's one of the six that we don't agree on. So I could create um, unnecessary division with someone by trying to argue or debate with them unnecessarily versus listening with an open ear and sharing my experience. And so, you know, I may have converted her to a supporter. She wasn't a non-supporter. She just didn't agree with me on that particular vote. So I may have converted her to a supporter on all the other things, but we just aren't gonna agree on this one. And that's okay. We don't have to agree on that one. So I would very specifically welcome comments from people that don't agree with me. You know, I represent District 40. I'm a Democrat, but there are Republicans and independents and just non-engaged, jaded citizens in my district, right? I want to hear from all of them, right? I don't, I don't know. I don't know what you're thinking when you hear about an issue. I don't want you to assume because I'm this party or because I look like I do or because I work in this particular job that I, I automatically think these things about, you know, whatever list of issues you have. Um, debate, civil debate is a cornerstone of this country. It's the cornerstone of our government. Um, we have got to get back to it. And, and the only way we can do that is by having conversations with each other not assuming things about each other, not hating each other before you even have introduced each other. Um, and and that's, that's exactly, so I absolutely welcome comments that are, um, you know, people think I won't agree with, because maybe I will. And once you find that common ground, it's a lot easier um, to continue finding common ground on other issues. Thank you all so much.